also Kelly. I just played hey. a, a part of Flower. Yeah. Um, of the game Flower. Is it really a game? I couldn't find anything to kill. <laughs> yes, well, that's a, yeah, what is art conversation? But yes, I'll say it's a game. Okay, it's a game. <laughs> uh, is, that a, is that a conversation that came up around Flower when it came out? Oh, definitely, yeah. And a lot of um, games that were sort of evolving in the independent game scene as well. There's a whole movement, in fact, started called the Not Games Movement, which was trying to tap into um, the way games uh, evoke emotion and feelings, but without mm -hmm. the traditional mechanics. Ooh. And, yeah. What's, what should we look at? What's a good example of that? So After this conference, what should we download? <laughs> I highly recommend Flower. Flower. Of course. <laughs> good. Um, no, I mean, uh, you could say uh, Gone Home is a good mm -hmm. one. Um, sometimes they're called uh, first person walking simulators. <laughs> so it sometimes falls into that category. That's, that's <laughs> not selling it. Uh, the Graveyard, um, a lot of Tale, Tale of Tales projects. Yeah. Uh, in fact, they were uh, sort of started that movement themselves. <clears throat> For, I did a little poll early on how many people had played Journey. Yeah. Uh, there was a fair number, but those who don't know you already, uh, what are one or two things that they should know about you before we get started? Yeah, so I, th I thought just to um, set the foundation is to understand that uh, that game company, which is the studio I co-founded and developed uh, Flower and then Journey, which you're about to see, um, the mission was to create uh, these artistically crafted games that would push the boundaries of games as a communicative medium. So really exploring themes that in some ways were experimental because they were ones that had not really been done before in the commercial video game uh, marketplace, but also uh, themes that we thought could be more accessible to an even wider audience than uh, maybe traditional games had been in the past. Mm -hmm. And have they been accessible to a wider audience in your experience? Uh, yeah, in my experience. I mean, it's always with every project, it was kind of that experience of falling off a cliff, not knowing for sure, like knowing that the final game we made we thought was good, but not knowing if the themes and the experience and the messages would really land with audiences, mm. but um, they were uh, all very successful on the PlayStation Network platform, but then in addition, just the messages we would receive from players, um, people who really just were so appreciative of having a game that they could share with someone else who they really cared for, um, mm. but who didn't understand why they were really into video games. And they were like, I can show them this, or I can play with them. And that was a partner, a parent, a child. Um, it really, so you've right. saved a lot of marriages and families. <laughs> I, I hope know. so. <laughs> um, I'm a user experience designer, and I think a lot of us are. But we don't really know that much about designing for particular experiences. We tend to design things that are uh, useful and um, easy to understand and learn, but rarely designing towards a particular experience. And that's something I hope to learn something about from you. So we, the idea that we had would be to watch a segment of Journey mm -hmm. and that you would talk us through it and talk about some of the specific experiences that you were aiming for. Is there anything you want to say to set up uh, before we show that video? No, I think I, I laid the foundation already, so we can launch into it. And I'll so talk let's about it. let's have a look at Journey. Yeah, yeah. Hopefully, this will be some nice after lunch <sighs> entertainment here. What we're going to see is kind of a cut of Journey from the very beginning through the end. So spoiler alerts for everyone, but it's been out for a while, so. And we'd like to see it on this <laughs> monitor, please. Yeah. For Kelly. So I don't have to keep looking around. We don't want to break your neck. I know. Um, so, in establishing um, the world of Journey and the very beginning of the experience here, uh, we have something that uh, was kind of a technique that we developed uh, while creating Flower. Um, and then we used again here, we sort of call this like the palette cleanser. So to 
recognize that the player is coming from some other environment. Maybe it's another game that they've been playing on their PlayStation. Maybe it's their work day, their life, whatever. And um, sort of washing that away and getting them into the mindset that we want them in to experience this game. So yeah, in Journey, you play as this uh, robed figure. You have the ability to do that call or that shout, and pressing down hard on the button will make a bigger one, lighter will do a, a smaller one. There you go. Then you can use traditional console controls of moving the camera around with one stick, but you can also just tilt. And a lot of work was really done around um, the camera system, so making it uh, as much as possible that you didn't even have to turn the camera around if that was not something, because that's a, a big barrier for a lot of console players. And again, the idea being to create an experience that was accessible thematically to a wide variety of audiences. That accessibility for us as a design philosophy ran through every aspect of the game. Mm. Um, so there's uh, very little to no language in the game. Um, very simple controls. There's no timer. Uh, there's nothing that's going to fight you. There's no pressure. Um, it's really meant to be uh, an invitation into an experience that we want you to have and not a, a, a series of punishments for not doing the things that we want you to do. Mm. I also think the mountain that we saw briefly, it's uh, very yes. clear. It's like I'm always heading for that mountain, so I know what I'm supposed to be doing. Yes. It's very, very clear. So, yes, um, th thank you for reminding me. And you can see the mountain here, which is a theme uh, throughout. You are on a journey to the mountaintop. Um, and yes, this is absolutely founded in uh, Joseph Campbell's her Hero's Journey. Um, the research of Joseph Campbell into these made uh, common themes of prominent stories throughout human history. Um, and again, trying to, in our exploration of creating experiences that um, would be relevant to a wide audience and would be accessible to a wide audience, uh, Genova came upon Joseph Campbell's um, Hero of a Thousand Faces uh, and thought, what if we could bring that into a game? Could you, could you then make a game that really resonates with a, with a wide audience as well? Mm -hmm. So you'll absolutely see sort of some of that basic structure of the, of the hero's journey presented throughout. Do you think that's something that the, the player, uh, that it affects the player, the fact that it's based on this? Uh, I, I do, yeah. I mean, uh, one of the goals of the project was to create this, um, to, to sort of map that similar emotional journey. I keep doing this because that's like <laughs> the, the shape. I guess I'm doing it backwards for you, but it's like the, the beginning and then you, you sort of start su succeeding in your journey and then there's this like downward turn of failure. It's also like the three act structure of Hollywood movies um, and there's catharsis and, and resolution. Um, and mapping everything in the game um, from the color palette to the uh, mechanics of what you're doing or the difficulty of what it is you needed to do, mapping all of those to, to that emotional journey um, was the idea of like, could, could you create this experience and, and have people have this similar yeah. experience of catharsis? Uh, it's, it seemed to work, I should say. <laughs> I can't there speak is, for everyone. There is a point in the game when I played it where I did feel teary-eyed. Would you be able to say where that was? Would you have a guess? I could have a guess, yeah. Will, will we see that we'll, later on? Yeah, I think yeah? you will see it. Will I here. tear up? Yeah. <laughs> I, know that, I know there's a part I always tear up, so. Oh. <laughs> um, so yeah, in the world of Journey, uh, you have... Um, this concept of kind of cloth as a life force or, or an energy source in the world. 
uh, you can bring these um, shredded pieces of cloth to life. Uh, they can then age you. Um, there are things to collect to lengthen your scarf, which allow you to sort of soar farther. Um, and then you can encounter more complex sort of forms of life as you progress through the world. There is a huge kind of Bible backstory to the world of Journey, and one of the things that we were tooling around with the most in our development process was how much of that story to reveal to the player. Mm -hmm. Again, wanting to create an experience that was inviting to a wide variety of people, so not wanting to be too heavy-handed or prescriptive in what they should be thinking about or feeling about, but giving them enough to you know, hang their hat on to draw them through this experience um, and give them that, that, that journey that we wanted them to go on. Um, I should say that one of the main tools we used throughout development was, uh, was playtesting. So we would have a playtest of something, some aspect of this game, every two weeks. Um, and I remember a period of time where we were really going back and forth and like how much to show and how much not to show. And for a while it was very sparse, the amount of story that we revealed to the player. But people had this feeling like they were supposed to get something, mm -hmm. but they couldn't understand it. And so then that just made them feel really stupid. And so we were like, well, that's not how we want you to feel <laughs> during this game. And so dialing it up a little, um, it was one of those dials. I'd say that and the camera system were probably the two mm -hmm. things that we were tooling on the most. And when you do the playtesting, um, how do you gauge what the experience is like? Is it just you ask them, or do you have any other tools? Yeah, so um, it is a lot about uh, asking, asking them while they're playing, uh, what are they thinking? I mean, that's, uh, as you're all f totally familiar with, sort of the critical user journey mm -hmm. um, aspect of it, getting an idea of where they're getting stuck or frustrated. Later on in the development cycle, when we have more of the game fleshed out, we would just let people play and then answer a series of questions afterwards, um, including how does, like, think about this level, what's a word that, you, that comes to mind when you think of it? So sort of see if they're hitting upon um, and what so might be a things. word that, that would be the basis of this level? Uh, yeah, so it would be excitement, joy. I mean, this is meant to be kind of that emotional high right before you go down, and you will literally in this game go down. <laughs> um, so this is really when uh, you're, um, yeah, feeling a lot of excitement. Um, you feel very competent and confident in your abilities in the experience. Uh, and I realized we glided right by, so to speak, um, encountering another player. So uh. Journey is an online multiplayer game. Um, and in it, you can encounter another player who is, who is a real person somewhere else in the world. You can't speak to each other. You can't see uh, each other's you know, PlayStation Network names. Um, you can only communicate through these calls and just through the act of being near one another. Um, if you end up drifting apart or you're playing, you know, one person's really wants to go as fast as possible and you want to hang out and explore, then in the back end of the game, you will be naturally disconnected and left, to be, uh, left open to be connected to someone else. Did people feel as if they were encountering another player or just a part of the, of the game? So a number of people did say that they assumed that it was an artificial intelligence or, yeah, non-player character. Mm -hmm. um, did you do Which anything? I just thought was funny because it was like, we're not that good. <laughs> <laughs> to cheap create. AI. <laughs> yeah, cheap AI is a kid. Um, it, it did work out. Uh, well in that the fact that there was no language meant we could have a global server. So in, in most multiplayer games, you are required to do some coordinated action, mm. which means that you need to speak the same language in order to coordinate your actions, or you're going to have not so great of an experience. Um, but because there's no language here, you really it really could be anyone anywhere in the world, which also, I think, 
increase the possibility of, you, of any one person ever finding another person online, which worked out well. We were always terrified of um, either the game comes out and like just not a lot of people are on it, or a month later, like not a lot of people are on it. And so there was a very um, deliberate effort to create a meaningful single player journey so that the game would still be relevant um, and entertaining mm. uh, regardless of the number of other people online. Um, yeah. And I mean, it's just been so thankful that even today when I play, I, I usually encounter someone That's else, me. which is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. <laughs> did, you, did you do anything mm -hmm. to strengthen the experience of the other player being a player? Like any, mm -hmm. any tricks? Strengthen. Well, the I mean, uh, going back to the previous question, where how do I know that it's another player and get a sense of that as opposed to it being driven by the system? Was there anything in the design that gave me clues that this was a, a real pe person playing this other character? So not until, I mean, the only way you know is that at the very end, um, I mean, we might see it, I can't remember if it's in this clip, um, but you'll see a, uh, a message about other people that you played with, mm -hmm. and that's when um, their network handles are revealed. Um, and we had a number of players say they like jotted down those names and then messaged the other person and followed up with them later. and. Yeah, wow. so that was really amazing. Um, so yeah, now we're at kind of the, the moment of catharsis and, and resolution. Um, this last level was mm -hmm. also the one other thing we were working, up, working on up until the very end. We uh, could not figure out a way to um, end the game well. And it was actually the composer, Austin Winery, um, I mean, this is two months before we we're supposed to ship the game, sent this email late one night um, about just how he felt after watching another friend play and the kind of experience he thought it should end on. And he, and he said, and I've I sketched out the score um, that, that expresses how I think it should feel. Uh, and that score is pretty much exactly what you hear in this final level. And the, the team came in and was just so galvanized and energized by that. It's just one of those lucky design moments that you, mm -hmm. you never can count on, but thank God it did for this game because I think it did really help round out the, the entire experience. Um, and really we, the entire level was designed um, inspired by that single track that he did that night. Could you so describe this? Is the part the I always cry, by the way. Oh, this is, this is where you cry. Okay. Yeah. I just love the strings here. They're so awesome. <laughs> so epic. Could you describe <laughs> the experience of this, like the, the end of it? What, do you, what, is the, um, what are you aiming for? Um, so I keep trying to find uh, synonyms for catharsis. <laughs> <laughs> That's like the ultimate sort of um, uh, elation that is felt at this moment, sort of achieving the goal that you've been after this whole time and really finding, I think also what's important is to, is, is that it needed to feel complete complete in this moment, that, in the, that there's that aspect of it, uh, that the joy of it is in the journey and not necessarily a destination. I mm -hmm. think that's sort of embedded here because uh, what happens is you get to this mountaintop and it will go to white and you never see what's on the other side of it. Um, and in fact, you end up flying, uh, sort of your spirit flies all the way back to the beginning of the game again and you're left to start over. Um, what kind of endings yeah. did you, tr before you found this through the score, what kind of endings were you exploring that didn't work? So they were centered more around uh, feeling powerful, which is certainly present in this version of the final level, but I think in a different way. Um, there is this sense of uh, like bursting out just over this giant wall that was at the top of the mountain. Um, 
maybe uh, sort of finally beating these uh, machines that had been uh, after you and after cloth energy this whole time. Um, and it didn't, it, it just felt sort of maybe predictable and a bit anticlimactic mm -hmm. in that way. Let's see if it goes through. I always feel hesitant to interrupt the game, which is interesting. <laughs> it has that, those properties. Yeah. Good. <laughs> the cello resolution. This is not where I cry. <laughs> <laughs> you cry at the big I, I, story reveal. There's a thing where you're going yeah. up a hill. It's like a struggle. It's e I think it's even yes. hard. It's hard game mechanically to take go up. And yeah. It's like a, a, you're meeting a gale. That's where I, I teared up. Yeah. Yeah. Now, <laughs> you work at Google with augmented reality and virtual reality. Mm -hmm. So how does this relate to your game background? Um, what are you doing for them? Yeah, so what uh, Google was finding early on as Cardboard was uh, growing into what would become Daydream View is that there's sort of this new um, realm of mobile development as Google's VR and AR efforts have been um, primarily m mobile first, uh, so working with the devices that we all already have. And yet those spaces um, require uh, quite a lot of understanding of 3D development and who already has a lot of 3D design development experience, game makers. Right. <laughs> and so what we've See, so there's sort of a, um, a funny like collection of game developers at Google all <laughs> converging on this team. But then also in uh, what I do is work with external developers bringing experiences to these platforms. And in a number of cases, we have uh, game studios um, working on non-game projects sort of crossing uh, those, those arenas, which is something I've always been really excited about and, and interested in doing. So it's been really cool to, to be able to work with uh, organizations like BBC and yeah. New York Times um, and, and bring uh, game design and 3D development background into, into their brands and experiences. But if you have a lot of game developers because they have the experience of 3D, mm -hmm. do you feel that that's pushing AR and VR towards the gaming space too much? Or do you... <laughs> You know they're they're broad-minded and and uh, are happy to explore other things. Oh, I think they're very happy to explore other things. I think there's a large contingent of developers that that are like myself. Um, but I also think in the early stages of these technologies that uh, delight in the experience mm -hmm. is is really important because. Um, in order for them to become extremely useful, they have to become much more robust than they are today. Um, but delightful experiences don't have to be robust. Mm. And in fact, uh, like one thing I say at, at Google a lot is that you know games games ship broken uh, every day. Uh, they are. You, just, you don't um, ship a game, you abandon it. Um, <laughs> but it's like the great game, the, what separates great games from the rest are, are that you have sort of designed for those broken pieces so that they don't feel broken, right? So like in Journey, um, we had a tiny team. It was 13 people at its max. And uh, originally, there, the avatar had arms. Mm. Um, but we found in playtests that when your avatar has arms, people expect your character to be able to climb or push each other or interact in those ways, which we weren't opposed to. But there's no way our tiny team could have supported the animations and the rigging and all of that stuff that would have been required to that system. Mm. So we just cut their arms off. So it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's lucky that, that you could afford legs, <laughs> yeah. basically. We should yeah. be happy. And then there's just two little triangles, <laughs> if you notice. Yeah, that's yeah. true. No feet. <laughs> that's right. Hmm. So do you have a way of, you're saying, I think this is fascinating, finding these pieces of delight and then hanging the, the design around that. So what are some pieces of delight in the VR space? Uh, so the, 
the main piece of delight in the in the VR space is really that initial um, sense of immersion, mm-hmm. um, and the just that experience um, of what. It gets sometimes called like lightly interactive, where it doesn't rely on you doing too much, but it's that is about experiencing what's around you. Um, I think of it as sort of a low cognitive load experience. Like you just want to go somewhere different. Um, I mean, even things that I'm like getting nervous about this. Yeah, I, time. I can't even <laughs> interpret that. I'm not sure where we are. Okay, <laughs> we're okay though. I have no idea. We have no idea what we're doing up here. <laughs> this is the theme of it all. So immersive, yeah. that's right. <laughs> So, yeah, so... Um, Could someone actually give us, like, a, a number of fingers where we are? Someone trustworthy? Oh, one minute until... Okay, good. Oh, okay, all right. So this one minute. Um, all right. Oh, what a shame. I have the best question. Okay. We're never going to get it, get it to <laughs> no! that one. So we're not going to get to the, the best question. I'll... Uh, we'll write something. I'm not sure. Before lunch, I invited the audience to uh, pose you questions. In fact, I said... What's the one thing you would regret not asking Kelly Santiago? Okay. And uh, Emma has collected some questions and will will come up and join us. Oh and gosh. Ask two or three of those. Hello, Emma. Just put this there. That's not the questions, though. Here are the questions. <laughs> <laughs> so, Kelly, uh, you have uh, at least one huge fan of yours in the audience today. Uh, possibly more, but I know at least one, and um, uh, he's got a question for you. Okay. So in Journey, um, a lot of the usual game features, such as UI, time constraints, and the risk of dying, as you mentioned, mm-hmm. have been removed. Was this a starting point, or was it something that you that arose during the design process? Uh, absolutely, it was a starting point. I mean, it goes to that. Um, goal of creating an accessible game experience. So um, really trying to remove the barriers that we saw, especially non-gamers, encountering. And um, one of my favorite things in Flower and Journey is handing a non-gamer this controller and they panic. (laughs) They're like, oh, I don't know what to do. (laughs) <laughs> it's just like, you literally cannot do anything wrong. Like, just move the thing around and explore. Mm. Yeah. Mm. That's an excellent starting point. <laughs> I'm one of those, actually. Yeah, yeah <laughs> good. Yeah. I'm like, really looking forward to playing Johnny. I also have one question from someone who has been working 20 years in the gaming industry, and as um, I, I can thank uh, many, el- many others, have gone quite tired of all games being very dark and dystopian, so he was very happy about playing your game. And he, he mentioned that one, he loved the fact that yours is so bright and positive. Mm. Uh, and I don't know now if he was referring to Journey or, or a flower, um, <coughs> but he said that in the end, it also becomes dark. Mm-hmm. How come? Like, does it have to? For the hero's journey, it had to, or at least that's where we landed. Um, I totally think it's a valid question. Um, Part of it it was time limitations of the project. We did have a publisher who was expecting a game in a certain amount of time for a certain amount of money, um, which we still broke, both those things. But uh, (laughs) um, we didn't come up with any better ideas, I'll say that. Um, but I, it's definitely a, a question that's worth exploring mm. more. So the, the answer is really like, no, it really doesn't have to be dark and dystopian? Or? I, I don't think it has to, mm. uh, just didn't figure out a b- mm. better way. In that particular yeah. way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you were talking about like you're now at Google, and this, I think this question is a bit related to that. What are your tips? Uh, from gaming industry to other industries except gamification. And I guess that uh, what she's searching for is like, are there tools or methods or approaches that can be applied in other industries? Like you mentioned 3D, VR. Yeah, I mean, I think that um, 
and this may be nothing new to many members of this audience, but that, that concept of really the holistic experience of the user um, and prioritizing, having that as a priority um, is something I see, at least so far in my work in Silicon Valley, as a difference um, between game development and um, most tech and software development, um, which is, you know, it's not just the critical user journey, it's not just um, making sure the user can do what you want them to do, but also having like, what is the emotion I want them to feel? What is the thing I want them to walk away thinking about? And having that at the top of the list of the things that you're solving for um, means that, yeah, that sometimes your experience can be messy or that you're uh, not necessarily fixing every broken thing because you don't have to actually fix everything in the critical user journey to sometimes to achieve that emotional goal. Um, and that's what really, you know, makes people remember what it is mm. that you, you created for them. So good meal, you. You're, you will forgive the waiter for being rude. Uh, no? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think if you design the restaurant in a certain way, they won't uh, be, yeah, they won't be put off if the waiter is rude. It'll seem like it's all part of mm, one whole experience. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> That's an interesting thought. Like you always <laughs> intended it to be that way. <laughs> that would be like a very social media <laughs> experience. Okay, uh, so one last question for you. Um, how do you think the increasingly toxic gaming and online communities can be influenced by the type of ambient and positive communication that you have made possible in Journey? Yeah, I, uh, for me, one of my theories going into Journey was, can you design an online experience that encourages people to behave in a different way? And I feel that Journey is an unequivocal yes. Absolutely, that like the the behaviors um, players exhibit in some online games and online arenas um, aren't they they aren't just um, defaults. They aren't that that the designers of those experiences absolutely have uh, control and they have responsibility to. Um, to shape those spaces in a different way. And people, I mean, again, with the, uh, the restaurant example is like, I think if you uh, are in a McDonald's versus, you know, a three-star Michelin restaurant, like some of it is the money you're spending in those spaces, but part of it is like the way it's designed, you behave differently in those spaces. Brilliant. So yeah, we all have the power to actually design the communication, com uh, communicative communities. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, don't, yeah. I don't think it's just a, a default behavior. I mean, um, you think about like uh, your average online shooter, like a, a Call of Duty, uh, and the experiences logging in and getting cursed at by like a 12-year-old somewhere in the world, and you like never want to touch it again. But what you don't know is like, Cursing and like provocative language is a strategy in those games. When it's so such about twitch controls and really responding as fast as possible, you want to do things mm. that are going to throw your opponents off. Mm. So yeah, that game is absolutely designed to create those scenarios. <laughs> That's me again. So looking for <laughs> so then we were looking forward to many others playing your games <laughs> and we will have a better world basically yes. <laughs> and make more of them. That's the big mm. thing. That would be great. <laughs> and we have a gift for you. Let's see. Can yeah, oh, there we go. <laughs> Alexander comes. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Thank you. I enjoy yeah, that so much. Thank you very much. Well for done, the time. Kelly Santiago. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Let's follow Alexander. Okay. Thank you.